Okay, I think our numbers are pretty steady now, if we're good to start. So, hi everyone, welcome to our seminar series. My name is Kazi, I'm subbing for John today. I'm gonna to be moderating our seminar. Uh, so today, I'm happy to welcome Professor David Stensrud from Pennsylvania State University. He will be presenting on using the dual polarization WSR 88D radars to observe and study the convective boundary layer. At the end, we will have a Q&A session as always. And as a reminder, this talk is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Now I will hand it off to Ralph, um, our associate director, to introduce our speaker. Yeah, thanks, Kazi. And yeah, welcome, David. Uh, we look forward to uh, to your talk shortly. I just a little background about David. Uh, so he's got uh, degrees uh, in math and meteorology from um, University of Wisconsin. And then um, also got his PhD at Penn State, uh, had a long career at the NOAA um, National Severe Storms Lab. Uh, and then uh, let's see, it says 2014, he uh, um, joined Penn State um, Department and was uh, former head, head of that unit there and does a lot of research. Um, in severe weather and also um, data simulation, and we will uh, we'll hear some some interesting work here coming up. So off to you, David. All right. Well, thank you, Ralph. That was very nice. Um, so yeah, I first want to before I forget, uh, thank my colleagues who contributed to this work. Uh, so graduate students Lynn Comer, Brady Stouffer, John Banghoff, and Sean Santianis, uh, and then undergraduate student Jacob Sorber, and faculty members. Uh, Matt Kumjin, Yung Ji Zhang, Ying Pan, and George Young. I also wanted to uh, basically give a shout out to all the federal employees. Uh, as you know, we just uh, averted uh, going into a federal shutdown on, on late Saturday. I've been a federal employee. I've always been incredibly impressed by the dedication and the professionalism of the federal staff. And so I just want to thank all the federal employees for the great work that they do. I know going into these kind of congressional uh, situations adds a great deal uh, a great deal of stress to to your work life and so I thank you for your service so I, I should also say I'm not a radar meteorologist I'm a meteorologist who likes to work with radar data and so uh, you know if you ask me detailed questions about radar I'm probably not going to be able to answer them but I'll do my best I thought I'd begin just with a brief history. So radar meteorology is a very rich field with a long history. I'm going to just touch on a sliver of it, which is, in essence, uh, sort of the history of the national radar networks in the United States. So the first uh, radar network was called the Weather, Servants, Weather Surveillance Radar in 1957. So they're all WSR. Uh, and then the year that follows um, was 66 radars that were constructed and deployed across the United States. Uh, this was largely in response to the devastating 1954 hurricane season. Uh, these radars were reflectivity only, pretty wide bandwidth. Uh, they were S-band, so 10 centimeters uh, for the wavelength. Uh, pretty small dish at 12 foot. Um, you had manual elevation scanning and basically, so for example, this image here from HRD shows a hurricane coming into the, the coastal area. If you wanted to track that, you'd have to use a grease pencil and then basically see how it moved based on where the grease pencil indicated the storm was versus where it's going. So very, a uh, uh, lot, of, lot of effort into tracking storms and making sense of them. So the next radar came out in 74 and was basically designed to fill the gaps in the 57 network. Uh, this was, again, reflectivity only, a little bit updated in terms of technology, uh, a little bit smaller beam width. Uh, these were actually C-band, so five centimeter uh, wavelength for most of the radars, and so attenuation is an issue for those. Um, and as you can tell from the map, basically the western United States was largely ignored in the, the combined 57 and 74 uh, network. And so then next comes the next generation radar. So this actually is a great success story that I think maybe is underappreciated in our field, because three federal agencies came together. So Commerce, Defense and Transportation. So NOAA, the Air Force, and the FAA joined together to find a replacement radar for a new national network. They actually fo uh, they formed the Joint Doppler Operational Project uh, in the late 70s to determine basically, or to answer the question, 
of whether or not Doppler technology could improve the detection of severe intranetic storms. And they spent several years answering that question, looking at case studies, and concluded in 79 that Doppler radar offers a market improvement for the detection of uh, thunderstorm hazards. And as part of the document, they actually outlined the next generation radar system that would beat the requirement of the three agencies involved. So, I mean, agencies getting together, working together, it's, it's a great success story and that continues to this day. Um, and then the proposal to create the next red network was then supported by the Reagan administration. And from that came the WSR 88D. So 88 is 1988, that's when the first contract was, uh, was basically approved and the D stands for Doppler. Uh, so the final radar became operational in 1997. So now we have reflectivity, Doppler velocity, so our radial velocities, uh, and spectrum width, plus a lot of products that went with that. Um, it's once again S-band, so 10 centimeter uh, beam width is less than a degree, so much better. A larger dish, increased sensitivity, uh, greater resolution and range. Uh, the volume scans then are basically predetermined and run automatically by the radar. Uh, Integrated radar displays, as you can see in the figure, and it operates pretty much continuously either in clear air or precipitation modes. Now, it's kind of interesting that it was always the intent to archive the radar data. And so initially, all the data was stored on eight millimeter tapes that, that were then sent to NCDC. Uh, thankfully, in the mid 2000s, that data compression approach was defined, and that basically led, led to things being transferred over the internet. So, this led to our current network across the United States um, 160 radars. Most of those are, of course, weather service. Uh, a good number then also are DOD sites. And of course, the FAA has the terminal Doppler weather radars, a separate network at uh, a lot of the hub airports uh, for commercial airliners. And this was again upgraded in 2013 to dual polarization. So once again, it basically they ran an experiment, so the joint polarization experiment over four years to look at the benefits of a dual pole radar and found that the new information on hydrometeors and precipitation estimation would be beneficial. So new observations came because of that. And of course, with dual pole now, not only do we get the power return from the horizontal, basically polarized uh, beam, but also from the vertically uh, vertical polarization. So it tells us something about the shape of the object. Uh, basically, the width divided by the height can tell us something about that. So that's kind of my history of the radar. Um, so I, I do think it is it's quite impressive, the uh, capabilities the ADAD has. So turning back again, so how can we use this to study the convective boundary layer? So just a quick reminder here, of course, during the nighttime, we have a stable boundary layer. And then during the daytime, it uh, basically converts to a mixed layer or a convective boundary layer. So basically, as our, uh, they say the surface warms because of solar radiation, uh, thermals develop that are warmer than the environment and begin to rise, and they rise until they hit their level of neutral buoyancy. They typically have some upward vertical motion, and so they extend a bit into the free atmosphere and drop back into the binder layer, mixing in some of the free atmospheric air with it. Um, so not long after sunrise, on a lot of classic days, we get a fairly strong uh, increase, fairly quick rapid increase in the depth of the convective binder layer. You might have cloud formation at the top. Uh, the zone where we're mixing in air from the free atmosphere into the boundary layer is called the entrainment zone. And then the boundary layer exists until, or the convective boundary layer exists until probably an hour or so before sunset, when basically the surface gets cooler than the boundary layer, and basically the stable boundary layer once again forms. And this cycles, of course, every day. And it's really impressive, the, you know, the amount of variation between nighttime and, and daytime boundary layers. And of course, if you take a Profile from a sounding, say in the middle of the atmosphere, middle of the uh, afternoon, you'll see theta v or theta is pretty much constant with height in the mixed layer, as maybe as mixing ratio. Uh, but then, as you hit the entrainment zone aloft, basically you'll get uh, higher values of theta v or theta, and typically lower values of mixing ratio. So two typical two typical circulations develop in the binary layer. Uh, the first would be horizontal convective rolls. So these are counter-rotating horizontal vortices that commonly occur. So I like this image from Comet here on the lower right. Uh, so basically we have these counter-rotating vortices that will form in the boundary layer uh, under certain conditions. And then the rising portion of that uh, circulation, if there's enough water vapor, condensation can happen and you'll get basically these lines of parallel clouds that form. We often call these cloud streets. 
Um, we often see them off the east coast of the United States when cold air basically in the wintertime moves over the warm ocean waters and basically through the, through the thermal instability, cloud streaks will happen. Uh, you can see they do broaden over time as you get a, a little bit away from the coast. So you get cell broadening that occurs, uh, but a very distinct formation and very easily observed by satellite if you can get clouds to actually form in the updrafts. So as uh, Ralph mentioned, I was at NSSL for a long time. And uh, so I looked at a lot of radar data. Uh, often it was on the screens around the laboratory uh, or just been looking at colleagues uh, and what they were up to. And during the summertime, you would often see this. So this is from what, June 18th, 2014. So if you look at this pattern, so first of all, the reflectivity values are generally less than 20, maybe 15 or, or less, so not. This is a clear air situation. There's no convection going on in terms of precipitating storms. Uh, but you do see hints of perhaps these linear structures that occur. Uh, if you follow the sort of the red pointer here, you can see something seems to be lining up. Um, it's just that you can't see it too well because the color scale is really intended to look at precipitation features, not so much worry about the clear air features. But a lot of days I'd see this kind of structure, which is very suggestive. Uh, and then I might look at satellite and actually see that uh, we did have cloud streets that were forming. Now, they may not be continuous. These are called uh, a string of pearls, uh, but they still are indicating these counter-rotating counter -rotating vortices that occur in the modular. Now, the other kind of uh, organized circulation you often get in the convective modular is called cellular convection. So this is a regular pattern of cells. Um, in general, they typically are circular or Classically, they'd be hexagonal. Uh, they can be, be viewed from satellite. Uh, you might have clouds along the edges. On other days, you might have clouds in the middle and the edges basically are cloud free. Uh, but this is another very common kind of binular uh, circulation in addition to the turbulent structures that happen. And this is what happens if you take the ADAD and you change um, basically the color bar. So now I'm enhancing basically brief activities between uh, you know, basically zero and 20 dBZ. And you start seeing these nice linear structures. Now, if I'd show you loops, it would become really apparent uh, what's going on here, but I've had generally bad luck showing loops over Zoom. So I'm gonna stick with the, the fixed image here, but very distinct. So what you're seeing here actually are insects. So insects basically, and the updraft are not happy with that. And so they, they work against the updraft, which leads to higher concentrations of insects in the updraft compared to the downdraft. And so you start seeing these lines basically of counter-rotating vortices. So updrafts and then downdrafts. And on the right side, then I have an image of cells where in some of these places you can see these very circular indications. Of course, cellular structure isn't always nicely circular. It can take different forms, but if, if you loop this image, uh, on this particular day, you'd see a lot of cellular structure going on. So the radar is able to sense uh, a lot of what's going on in the bondular just by changing your color scale and how you look at the reflectivity patterns. So the first study we just wanted to look at, you know, we know that convective roles and cells are important components of the bondular. Um, and they look like they occur on a lot of days and they've often been uh, sort of cons uh, considered very common in the binder layer, but how common really are they? And of course, about this time, we're also starting to see roles in convection allowing model forecasts. So it'd be nice to know if the models are producing roles and cells basically at the same frequency that observations suggest, which is still an unanswered question at this point in time. So the first project we basically wanted to look at just a general climatology for one radar site for HCRs and cells. And we picked central Oklahoma, where I knew that they existed a lot. We just looked at the warm season, so April through September. We did for 10 years, so 2008 to 2017. Uh, that's over 1,800 days total. So reflectivity loops during the daytime were examined for each day. So that was basically John and Jacob looked at those. Uh, roles and cells were identified by visual inspection. Uh, certain end times were noted. The horizontal wavelength and the orientation angles of the roles were calculated. Uh, then we also spent some time looking at, can we discriminate between role environments and environments for cells based on the, the, the data that we have? So this is the results of the climatology then. 
Uh, so on the left side, we have percent of days in the month for April through September. And the blue means are some bundular organization. So either roles or cells that are present for at least 30 minutes. Um, and you can see that basically a little bit of a downturn in May overall. And July has the highest month, but over 80%. Uh, the green bars then are uh, basically days with precip. So on some days, if it rained early in the day, we wouldn't get any kind of uh, behavior going on because the body layer has been stabilized. Uh, there also are days where we didn't see any rolls or cells and there wasn't precip, so basically null cases. And then occasionally we our days were just were way too complicated. So it was impossible to say if there were rolls or cells or, or just a mess. Now, if you take out the days with precip, then basically 92% of the days have either rolls or cells for at least 30 minutes. So these things are ubiquitous. Uh, they occur on the vast majority of days during the warm season, probably during the cold season as well, and that'd just be a little harder to see. And on the right side here, we then have basically a determination of what are what are we actually seeing with the radar? Um, so the gray is basically only rolls. Uh, rolls in, in the green then is rolls and precipitation. So this would be if precip occurred later in the day, but we were able to see rolls early on. Uh, and then we have cells in the light blue and cells and precipitation in the green. And then the purple basically is if we have roles that then transition into cells, and then sometimes cells will transition back to roles. So you can see that in the early months, May, June, May, April, May, June, uh, basically we have a dominant, basically roles are probably the most common structure we see in the binder layer in terms of an organized circulation. But by the time we get to the, you know, later in the summer, July, August, September, basically roles and cells are about evenly, uh, Evenly occurrence, uh, equally equally likely within the binder layer. Now here is basically the results for every month of the uh, the ten year period. So I won't just going to focus on a few things. Uh, first, HCRs or cells basically occurred every day of the month in July of 2011 and 2012. Also, that was a month with basically no pre precip. Seem to remember 2012 maybe was the Part of the summer where we had lots of days with over 100 degree uh, high temperature in Oklahoma that year. If we look down to May of 2015. This is the only month where some kind of organization was not present on at least half of the days. And that's because it was a very rainy month. So it almost rained on half the days during that particular month. And then over here, uh, basically in July and August of 2011, 12, and 13, we had a lot of days where we had transition between roles and cells. In fact, that was a dominant sort of mode is uh, going back and forth between roles and cells on those days. So if we look at the diurnal sort of cycle of HCRs, uh, they often form as early as about 9.30 in the morning local time. Um, I mean, they most commonly would develop by basically 11 in the morning. Uh, and basically within an hour after they form, we start seeing some transition into cells, which is the purple the purple part. Um, once they've been around for a little while, they can get, basically roles can form from cells uh, and roles can occur as late or initiate as late as 2022 20, UTC. Um, but pretty much by the time that you hit zero Z, uh, roles and cells are all uh, basically disappearing for the day. I think there are only 48 cases where it went past uh, one UTC where actually rel roles and cells were still uh, being able to be seen by the radar data. And in terms of environments, we looked at a variety of different measures trying to discriminate between roles and cells and the mean bondular wind speed as determined from the ADAD seemed to be probably the best discriminator. And we found a value of six meters per second. So lower than six meters per second, we would see cells. Greater than six meters per second, we would see roles. This agrees with work you know, by a number of others like uh, Tammy Weckworth, uh, somewhere between six and seven meters per second seems to be the threshold value uh, for going from cells to rolls. But then these, uh, so cells are the black circles uh, or rolls are the black circles, cells are the, are the blue squares. And then the sort of the triangles, which are kind of gold colored are the days where we had no circulation. Um, so we had 50 days of each. And that's still a mystery to me is why on days where we have pretty strong wind speeds and we have pretty good sensible heat fluxes, we still don't get any kind of circulation to occur. 
I think that's a very interesting question for somebody to probably uh, try to answer at some point in time is why don't we see organization going on at some point during the day? Now, I want to mention a little bit about the value of serendipity. Um, so as you might have noticed, we started looking at data from 2008 and went through 2017. And the Twin Lakes radar was actually upgraded to dual pole in 2014. So we decided to look at what dual polarization variables could provide looking at roles and cells. Is there any value to the dual polarization variables? And this is what we started seeing on a number of days. So this is a PPI. So it's basically a planned position indicator. So just basically looking at the radar horizontally. Uh, this is, I think, the four and a half degree elevation scan. So on a lot of days, we started seeing this behavior. So near the radar, we have values around the radar, you know, kind of in the reds and yellows. So values of differential reflectivity um, of somewhere between four and seven. Then there'd be the zone of blue, which indicates values of maybe one to two for ZDR. And then beyond that, you'd go back to the higher values again. And so that became something that we got very interested in. And I remember it's some work that was done by uh, Valerie Melnikov at uh, was then Sims and NSSL. So Valerie, uh, Dick Doviak, Dushan Zernick, um, and then I added in the meteorology part. Um, so he had, Valerie had developed a special scanning strategy uh, for the AD8D that would have longer dwell times to basically try to calculate the refractive index, index uh, structure parameter. And what we have here on the top right is uh, this is a, an RHI, so a vertical scan, um, looking at ZDR. And what he found is that at the top of this layer, so below it, we have high values of ZDR, so three and above because they're all black. And this layer around, layer around two kilometers where ZDR values are basically in the green, so it's basically right around zero or so. And this actually coincided with the top of the binder layer. Uh, so this happens to be caused by Bragg scattering. Uh, so basically, if you have, so anytime you have basically thermals that are rising and they're hitting the top of the binder layer, you can have, uh, basically, you're going to be mixing in uh, air from the free atmosphere. And so that leads to refractive index gradients. And if they're on the scale, if these gradients are on the scale of half the wavelength of the radar, so five centimeters, basically you'll get Bragg scattering, which is a basically a constructive interference that will happen. And so you get this very low ZDR if uh, basically this mixing is uh, isotropic. And so this layer of ZDR, again, is caused by Bragg scatterers at the top of the convective binary layer. So doing that, what Valerie did was basically a special you know, observation strategy, which you can't do with the operational versions of the radar. So we decided to look at a different way to see if we could get the same information. And so we have the radar, we use the four and a half degree elevation angle. And uh, so here's our radar in the center here. We're gonna assume the PBL top is, is right here with the red letters and here is our radar beam. So the radar then makes a scan all 360 degrees and you basically get the PPI of differential reflectivity. And so then if you think about what's going on, basically, if we go from the radar outwards to basically the edge of this low ZDR layer, uh, basically what the radar is, again, is seeing is insects. And so insects have a plan form, or of course they have wings, and so they're very long horizontally, but they're very thin vertically. And so you get large values of ZDR because horizontal uh, basically, the energy in the horizontal direction is larger than the energy return or the power return in the vertical direction. And then you basically hit this layer of Bragg scatter, and it may not have ZR of, of zero because there are some insects there, but you have a local minimum basically in ZDR uh, throughout that Bragg scatter layer at the top of the PBL where we have this, uh, basically the thermals are basically in training in air from the free atmosphere. And then as you go out the other side, basically you return to having very high values of ZDR from basically some insects that are on the top of the binder layer or have escaped from the binder layer. So then you can apply what's called the quasi-vertical profile technique. So what we do is we average the radar observations around all, all 360 degrees uh, at a fixed range from the radar. And then once we have that average value, we convert range to height. And then we do that for all ranges. And so what you end up getting basically is a height profile of ZDR. That's the azimuthal average of ZDR. And then we plot that at the sort of the time of the last observation. 
And when you start plotting then successive observations, you get a time height profile of ZDR. So on the right here, I have sort of the classic idea of a mixed layer where it grows, you know, fairly quickly, you know, sometime around noon. So it gets gets uh, as, the, as the thermals rise and sort of levels off at some time late in the day. Um, and this is what we get from a specific uh, QVP, so quasi-vertical profile of uh, differential reflectivity from the Twin Lakes radar, where we see that, again, we have large values of ZDR uh, late in the day near the sort of in the ground area. These values, this is the insect signal. But then we have this minimum of ZDR in the vertical column that would be indicative then of the top of the bondulator. And so the white line indicates, in essence, an estimate of bondulator depth or the bindle top. And then this is actually the sounding, the sounding drive uh, from, the, from basically the Norman Oklahoma sounding on this day, which looks pretty good. Uh, and so we went ahead and looked at all days from 2014, uh, looking at the radar data and calculating QVP, calculating in essence the uh, CBL top from the radar at 23 UTC, which is roughly around the time the sounding was launched, and then also looked at the soundings and basically derive CBL depth from them and plotted the two. And yeah, as you can tell, uh, on the y-axis, we have a QVP uh, derived P, uh, CBL depth from the radar. On uh, the x-axis is a sounding derived CBL depth. And the two agree quite well with a pretty good root mean square error. And so it looks like it works pretty well for identifying the convective bond layer depth because of the Bragg scattering layer that occurs. Now it doesn't happen on every day, but it, it does happen frequently. And that allowed us then to go back uh, for at least some of the cases and look at aspect ratio for the convective roles. So the aspect ratio is just the different, the distance between the two updrafts, the two nearby updrafts, closest updrafts, uh, divided by the depth of the bond layer, which now we could get from the radar. Uh, theory predicts uh, predicts a value of three for the the roll aspect ratio, and that's indicated by the, the yellow vertical lines here. And we notice that for pure HCRs, so these are days where we only had HCRs, no no cells occurred in these days. That's pretty much right in the center of the distribution. Um, this is on the the top row is for the first hour where rolls were observed. The bottom row is for the last hour. We notice that late in the day, it's certainly Aspect ratio of three is the dominant, but we still have a good number of cases with pretty large aspect ratios, which is a little unusual. Um, and then we also looked at cases where it was either before transitioning to cells or after transitioning to cells. And certainly aspect ratio of three is, is very common. If you look at it throughout the day though, so now if you just look at the time perspective, uh, you notice that during the middle of the day, uh, aspect ratios of three are basically what we see on, on average. But early and late in the day, we get departures and we start seeing larger aspect ratios. And so we have seen wide horizontal convective rolls over land. Uh, they're very common over the oceans, uh, haven't been observed much over land. We saw them on a number of cases. Uh, we're basically late in the day, basically the HCR circulations, uh, some of the rolls would basically would diminish, but this there'd be this preferred wavelength that would be maintained, as you can see on a lot of these images. Uh, so basically you could pick out sort of this dominant wavelength that would be maintained. And it got up to, I think this case here is uh, basically an aspect ratio of 15. So these typically occur when you have very long lived HCRs. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting feature in the mind layer that I don't know that's been appreciated uh, in the past. So after that, so we basically can use the ADD then to take a look at convective roles and cells and determine how frequently they occur and actually see them if they're ongoing or not in the bondular layer. Uh, but back to circling, circling back then to the, the depth, of course. So I think we all know we can get convective bondular layer depth or, or PBL depth in general from Ray Wensons. It only occurs twice daily. Uh, LIDARs and wind, and wind profilers can also give, the, give us that information. Uh, salometers also could be helpful. Uh, GPS radio occultation, of course, can do that, and ACARS data can. But now, I think the radars can as well, right? But we've only shown this for zero Z data, roughly. And yet we know the structure basically cycles all day. That's kind of a, a really fast loop then of what you see with the ZDR observations. And so we wanted to ask, you know, does, does, does this relationship between where we have this low ZDR layer and the CBL top actually cold throughout the rest of the day? 
And so we got some funding to go ahead and collect observations to figure this out. Uh, so we launched small rainwind songs, which are called wind songs. Uh, over a couple of years during the daytime hours, uh, wind songs are kind of neat. That's just this, it's basically a sawn in a styrofoam cup. So they are very small. They need a very small helium balloon. Uh, we found them to be uh, very reliable and uh, they work really easily. And so we launched them basically from the top of the building, uh, different times of the day, uh, on days where we had a, a ZDR signal to see what was uh, basically going on and compared them to our nearby uh, State College uh, WSR 88D radar. And this is what we found. So the blue circles are launches before 11 in the morning. Uh, the green squares are between 11 and 2, and the, kind of the brown triangles or burgundy triangles are after 2 o'clock. And it pretty much didn't matter what time we launched them. This relationship always holds that this ZDR channel is indicating the top of the binder layer as we uh, compare it to a radio sonde. So it doesn't matter what time of day you're launching during the daytime, this ZDR layer is going to tell you something about the top of the binder layer. So we basically confirmed what we had observed at zero Z, but now we know it holds all day long. Now, unfortunately, ZDR doesn't always show us the depth of the PBL. Um, so especially in the cold season, um, basically the refractive index gradients maybe are not strong enough or the PBL you know, thermals are weaker, but this is, I think from a, it's either in a late October or later in the year, I think it comes up later. So it would be hard to pick out, they say, their, their low ZDR layer here. However, we also calculated uh, ZDR variance. So this would be the variance in the azimuthal over the overall azimuths. Um, and when you do that, even on days where you don't see it in the actual ZDR values, you tend to see it in the variance. I guess this is a date from February. And we actually define that a new variable that kind of combines the two. So it's the absolute value of ZDR plus one then times the variance. We call this variable DVAR. Um, and that actually gives us a pretty good idea of what uh, the PBL does in terms of its evolution and depth during the daytime hours. So of course, it's one thing to look at it. And the next thing was, can we actually automate calculating the depth from the radar observations? And so the first thing we did was we looked at this DVAR variable and just manually wrote an algorithm that basically would start two and a half hours after sunrise, would look for a vertical minimum in the value of DVAR, and that would then be the bottom layer height. And then we would do it for the next observation and basically track these over time. And we did have to apply a maximum and a minimum in terms of the change uh, from one observation to the next. They're typically 10 minutes apart, so they can't be it can't change too fast, but sometimes you'll see a low value of DVAR that's pretty high up in the atmosphere. And so basically this helps us stay in the channel. And that worked pretty well, but it had issues, especially late in the day, it seemed to have uh, issues with uh, behaviors. And so then we also provide, uh, we tried a basically continuous uh, wavelet transform or CWT, which has been used a lot in LIDAR and wind profile studies to look at uh, basically the depth of the binder layer. Uh, uses a Ricker wavelet um, with a variety of peaks. And basically what it does that is that once again, two and a half hours after sunrise, we look for basically where the, the wavelet tells us things are going on. Uh, the local minimum in ZDR is detected by the CWT and it's basically saved and connected to the next time period. We still have to apply these maximum and minimums uh, to keep it within the channel. As you can tell, it has in general, this is true. It has trouble early in the day during the quick rise of the bind layer, uh, as basically not too long after sunset, but it does really well late in the day when the DVAR approach would sometimes have issues. And so we ended up combining the two methods using an inverse uh, variance weighting approach. Uh, so we calculated during, during the, uh, using the two different methods, we combine them, and then we do a bit of smoothing, and this is what the result looks like. So here's a, this is from a June case, uh, basically large values of ZDR in the boundary layer again, uh, because of all the insects, we have this sort of local minimum here and then ZDR values are actually quite low aloft, but both methods actually track that pretty well with the DVAR doing better early on and CWT, I guess for this case they're about even, but often looking pretty good. So this, the white line that is our algorithm indicated top of the convective binder layer. 
And this is just a comparison against some of our sounding observations that we took to a number of days uh, at State College. Um, so you can tell that the QVPs of differential reflectivity uh, look very different from day to day. Sometimes you get these very narrow channels uh, that kind of go out through the day. Again, pretty good agreement with the wind songs on these days. Other times, really narrow channel can occur and the al algorithm can track that as well. And then of course, sometimes during the cool season, we did this much more uh, difficult, but again, the ZDR variance is really helping us pick out the top of the convective bond layer on these days. And so it does seem like it, it works. It could be, it's not perfect, of course, but it, it does give a lot of value. And once you have it automated, um, you can look at basically different radars. And so it's just a handful of different QVPs of differential reflectivity. Um, so again, it's the time height profile of ZDR throughout the daytime hours. Uh, you can see that the algorithm tracks pretty well, uh, it follows through some of these narrow channels that are suggested. Um, you know, it's certainly not perfect, but it can get the quick rise that you might see in the summertime at Amarillo uh, versus a little bit uh, slighter rise at uh, what Fort Hood here uh, during January. And once you have that data, you can start thinking about doing monthly mean CBL depths, uh, averaging things together, looking at how the convective boundary revolves in different years at different locations. Uh, you know, there certainly are days where we don't get signals. So this is from State College. You can see, depending on the year, we might only get half the days in the month where we get a really clear, uh, basically, ZDR profile. Of course, some of these days are basically rainy days as well. But still, there's interesting behavior differences in, in behaviors and just how the boundary layer evolves that might be worth exploring. OK, now, since the uh, ADD can estimate the depth of the boundary layer, can also be used to estimate the entrainment zone. Um, so basically, you know, the certainly the depth of the binary layer is sort of our foundational parameter for you know, looking at the binary layer, but probably the, the parameter that we observe uh, is basically hardest to observe is actually the depth of this entrainment zone, the zone and over which basically we're entraining in free atmospheric air into the into the binary layer. So that's probably the one that's been hardest uh, to observe well. And yet, if you take a look at different QVPs of differential reflectivity, so QVPs of ZDR, there are days, as you've seen, where we have these really narrow channels, with a pretty narrow width of uh, basically this low ZDR layer. And there are other days where we get this very deep ZDR layer, um, low ZDR layer. And hypothesis is that this tells us something about the entrainment zone and perhaps even uh, you know, formation of force clouds, perhaps even active clouds on these on these days. So are the differences in thickness of this low ZDR channel related to the thickness of the entrainment zone? Now, there are reasons to believe that this is, is indeed true. So, uh, so first of all, in the upper left here, we have, this is again is an RHI, so it's a vertical cross section holding the essence the azimuth constant. Uh, reflectivity is on the left, uh, or on the top, and ZDR is on the bottom. And so from Melnikov and Zurich uh, back in 2017, and they're looking at growing thermals. So the reflectivity values are basically in the you know, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 range. Uh, but if you look at ZDR, ZDR values are basically 0 to 1. And so this is actually seeing thermals that are basically rising above the top of the binary layer into the free atmosphere, and then uh, basically falling back down again. If you look at different times, you see the behavior very nicely. So growing thermals are definitely being sampled. Uh, if you look lower in the binary layer, we have large values of ZDR again, indicating we have uh, basically insects from biota going on. And then there's this nice paper by Knight. There's a Knight and Miller paper in 19, I think it was 88. And then this is Knight Hall in 2002. Again, it's an RHI scan of growing cumulus clouds now. And prior to precipitation formation, growing cumulus clouds also tend to have ZR values of near zero. So we're getting mixing of uh, basically the cloudy air with the free atmospheric air, but also is leading to refractive index gradients. Uh, and you're seeing that as a ZDR of zero, basically in developing convection prior to precipitation uh, formation. And so we would expect then that the radar could actually do this. So once again, we had our you know, our 100 soundings, um, basically we're looking at 
Uh, on the upper right here, I have the uh, this is the DVAR, this combination of ZDR times the variance, uh, and again, as a function of time and the function of height. And so this low ZDR channel is developing during the daytime hours as the top of the PBL, but we also can look at the thickness of this layer. And just by experience, we've chosen a value of 10 uh, units that are in dB cubed to be the, basically the edges of the entrainment zone. Um, and then we look at our sounding. On this day, we have a pretty strong uh, inversion that happens. Uh, we have two profiles that start to drop off. So we basically use a change in and mixing ratio is sort of the bottom of the entrainment zone and returning uh, to more of a free atmospheric value as the top of the entrainment zone. The LCL is well above uh, the boundary layer on this particular day. And so from basically the sounding, we get an estimate of the entrainment zone depth of about 200 meters uh, from basically the value of DVAR from the radar, we're getting entrainment zone depth of about 250 meters at the same time. Now there are other days where we have these really deep uh, layers of low ZDR. Again, we can track the bottom and the top. This is the time of the sounding launch, a little over 13 UTC. Uh, basically, the radar tells us an entrainment zone depth of about 1,500 meters. Uh, from the sounding, again, we're looking at where theta is starting to increase, where Q is starting to decrease. And then when Q finally gets back to sort of its free atmospheric value, T minus the dew point, which is this is pretty much defined as the top of the entrainment zone. This is the bottom. And we get a zone depth of about 1,100 meters. Um, certainly is challenging getting in train and zone depths from soundings, but we think we're probably within, you know, a couple hundred meters, probably pretty well. Um, this day also ends up having active clouds. So these clouds are basically, uh, if you get to the depth that we're seeing up here, it's actually above its level of free convection. So we actually have some active convection going on, not just forced convection within the binding layer. And so then if we plot basically the, uh, again, now this time on the y-axis, we have the sounding derived entrainment zone depth. On the x-axis, we have the radar derived entrainment zone depth. And again, they match up pretty nicely. So the blue triangles are when we don't have any clouds present. And uh, the gray squares are where we do have binary clouds present. And some of these are active clouds. And we, we're going through right now to identify the active cloud cases based on our notes. Um, so it does seem like the ADAD can also observe entrainment zone depth from this quasi-vertical profile. So you can get convective bundular depth from the ADAD. You can also get entrainment zone thickness from the ADAD, and it's all due to this bright scattering that occurs from these refractive index gradients that occur either at the uh, top of the bundular, where we have you know basically isotropic turbulence going on at very small scales, or associated with basically the edges of uh, thermals and the edges of clouds that form. So looks like I'm in good time here. So in conclusion then, the ADAs are a very sensitive system. They can tell us a lot about the convective bond layer. So they weren't designed to sample the bond layer. They were designed to sample you know, convective storms, provide information on precipitation. But to do that, their mission required to have a radar that was quite sensitive. And because it has a sensitivity, we can see horizontal convective rolls and we can see cells in the radar observations. We can also then, by using this quasi-vertical profile approach, we can detect or estimate convective bondular depth using uh, differential reflectivity observations throughout the daytime hours and also get the thickness, uh, basically, of the entrainment zone uh, from this low ZDR channel, uh, again, from the quasi-vertical profiles. And so we can use ADAD observations of CBL depth to explore the evolution of the bondular on uh, daily, monthly, and longer time scales. Uh, could be monitor modular depth and operations. We could use it to verify model forecasts. I think there's a lot we could do with just modular research because this is a great sensor, right? It's out there every day. It's running every day. Um, it's providing information on the modular that uh, I think up until now has largely not been used very well. And so I also want to recognize National Science, Science Foundation for supporting this work. And with that, I will be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you for uh, being here today. Thank you. So at this time, um, you can raise your hand or you can just go ahead and unmute yourself um, to ask a question. Or if you want, you can just type your question in the chat and I will read it out loud. Go ahead, Dr. Lee.
Dr. Lee, you can ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, yes, uh, thank you for a very great talk. Um, I'm really like to see uh, uh, the result you showed that compare with the video sound, and I also showed good comparison with wind sound. I wonder how is the wind sound compared with the video sound because they, it seems they use a very different uh, meteorological quality. One use temperature and humidity, another use wind, right? So how do they compare each other? My second question is about uh, um, the infamous zone. Uh, you said the infamous zone is one kilometer. I look at your plot, I can see the changes. Indeed, there is a, a satellite range of uh, infringement, but uh, in the deeper side, uh, it's the uh, infringement seems very weak. So the question is, uh, how do you define the threshold for determining the infringement uh, there? Thank you. Okay, yeah, great questions. Um, so wind songs, um, you know, they have basically similar accuracy to other ray wind songs by like Vaisal or um, the other companies that provide ray wind songs. Technology is, is very similar. You know, it's basically measuring temperature, I guess half a degree, you know, relative humidity, and they use GPS to do the tracking, uh, just like, and of course they have a barometer for pressure and they track it using GPS. Uh, so it's just designed to basically be a boundary layer instrument. So typically by the time you get to about uh, five kilometers, um, you know, you, you lose track of it. And so it's really not meant to be one that, you know, will observe all the way up to the tropical pause, uh, but it does provide good information. And from, I don't, I believe there has been at least one study comparing the two. Uh, it has been a while, so I'm not sure, but we've we found it to be a very reliable and 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 basically good instrument. And so we're we're quite happy with the wind songs. Uh, they certainly have been used in other experiments as well. Uh, so it's becoming a more common. Now, in terms of yes, so exactly how you define and trainment zone depth from the radar. Uh, so we basically used a threshold value for this uh, DVAR. Uh, parameter. Um, that was done a bit by trial and error. Um, basically, we tried to find something that would define a top and a bottom. Um, and so it it was done a bit um, subjectively. Uh, but it, it does seem to work relatively well. Um, and certainly, there are errors in trying to estimate entrainment zone depth by soundings, too. Um, so again, this is our first look at it. It's It's certainly not not perfect in any way, shape, or form, but I think the results are uh, are at least pretty good, suggesting that this uh, information can be determined by the radar. Mm -hmm. Indeed, thank you. Thanks, so Will is next. Hi, Dave, uh, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, I just have a, a question, sort of a two-part question. Um, is there has there been research that's looked at the um, how the changes like the aspect ratio, other physical aspects of the structure, or the evolution back and forth between the HCRs and the cellular roles, uh, how that would potentially serve as a like indicating that there is impending convective initiation, um, and also if so. Um, do you see potential for developing some kind of an automated radar product for um, weather forecasters to use as a um, sort of a heads up predictor for uh, convective initiation coming? Well, interesting question. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know of any studies looking at, you know, transitioning from roles to cells as being uh, helpful for actually looking at CI. Certainly, you know, roles, you know, going back to papers by, you know, Wilson and, and Schreiber and, and others, um, you know, have, have pointed out that roles certainly can be contributors to, to CI, certainly if you have roles indicating, and, and usually if, if it's a role inter interacting with uh, some other kind of boundary, right, that can be kind of a preferred area for CI that, you know, I think there's nice papers by Atkins uh, looking at sea breezes uh, in Florida interacting with horizontal convective roles and leading to CI and even some work, I think by Conrad Ziegler and others uh, about the dry line interacting with the convective roles. Uh, now I don't remember in those cases uh, or any cases looking at cells interacting with structures that lead to CI. 
that might be in part because cells typically form in weaker wind conditions. And a lot of the cases that we see uh, are in stronger, more synoptically active cases to begin with. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting question. I don't think we've really looked at it closely enough to be sure, but it does, um, in general, I would say that usually you need roles to interact with something else to sort of lead to a preferred convergence sound that would lead to CI. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, so Dave can ask his question next. Yeah, thank you, Dave, great talk. Um, when I was thinking about this and looking at this, my mind immediately jumped to the next application. So to get the quasi-vertical profile, you need to, you're currently looking at an entire 360 degree azimuth scan, is that correct? That is correct. Is it, do you think there's gonna be much promise to using partial azimuth scans so that we can start to look at different boundary layer depths over different land use types and ultimately get to mosaics? So we actually have done some of that. Um, so as part of the grant, we actually hired a couple of uh, high school teachers to uh, do a summer research experience with us. And, and basically we divided um, the sectors into 90 degrees. Um, and we basically focused on, uh, I think we used uh, the Dover, um, Dover, Delaware radar and uh, radar in Florida uh, to basically look at places where we were likely to see sea breezes to see if we'd see some difference. And on a lot of days, it, it didn't seem to make a lot of difference, but there were a handful of days where it was clearly deeper and, you know, and part of the domain and, and, and the difference could be like 500 meters in terms of the depth. Uh, but you do need to have enough azimuth basically to, to do the averaging. So I don't know how fine you could get it. That's, that's an open question. Certainly with 90 degrees, it seemed to work. I would say on days where in essence, the modulator seemed to be pretty uniform in depth, all sectors would give us roughly the same depth and actually had a strong signal. Um, on the other days, so, you know, I just don't know if you could go to 45 degrees, if you could go to 30, uh, because it is noisy, right? So you, mm -hmm. part of the value of the QVP is, is basically smoothing out that, that noise. And I don't, I don't know enough about, you know, does that depend on the season or the underlying conditions, for example, in terms of how small, but it, it certainly is, I think, a great question and worth looking into. Do you think mosaics will be in the near future, you know, across larger chunks of the country instead of a radar by radar method? Well, I mean, at, at present, I mean, the QVPs and getting bundle or depth isn't operational by any means, right? We're, right. We have code that'll do this. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, we've assimilated the data as well into models and it seems to, seems to be beneficial, but it's, you know, getting it into an operational you know, routine where it's it's just part of what the ADA B does uh, is is you know still years away. I think we have to have that discussion. I don't know how long it might take um, to actually make that transition. And then yeah, could you do mosaics after that? I think research wise, you could any time we have the code. Excellent. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. Go ahead, Lisa. Uh, hello. Uh, I was um I. I saw your uh, at the beginning of your presentation. You showed that those rolling uh, clouds offshore in the east side of the U.S., right? Yes. Uh, I was wondering how much of all this can we apply in case of uh, you know shallow convection, like lake effects you know, over the Great Lakes, for example. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of. Certainly in State College, a lot of our lake effect actually is because of horizontal convective rolls that form off of, off of Lake Erie. Um, and so, yes, lake effect is generally driven by roll circulations uh, in the wintertime. Not all lake effect bands, I would say, are convective rolls, but the ones at least that hit State College, they are. Yeah. Right. And can, can we get... Uh... Since they are mostly precipitating, can we have uh, as much information about the boundary layer, or yeah, is they, that more difficult? No, I think certainly in terms of boundary layer depth, yeah, you could get that information from that pretty easily. Um, and of course, because they are precipitating, they show up very well on the radar. You don't have to worry about going down to reflectivity values of twenty to see it. It shows up quite nicely because <laughs> it's usually right. in the thirty to thirty-five range. Um, 
That's right. Thanks. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? I know there's Dave, your hand is still up, but I think that might be left over from. Actually, I don't mind asking another one. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so again, the stretching, stretching to the future. Do you feel like this is a chance to see the depth of the residual layer at night? I know you focus purely on the daytime, but there's often bright scattering associated with the top of that residual layer too. Yeah, and we have seen that on some days. Um, so I don't, I don't know. We, we focused on the convective side just because I was a whole lot more confident that would it would it would work. I mean, Not sure. <laughs> um, and it's just a lot of information, right, to deal with when you're trying to do this over many radars and, and prove you have a, a good signal. It is interesting, yeah, at night. There are some days where it persists at night and you can see a very clear signal, which I think would is the top of the you know residual layer. And you can see changes too. There are days where that layer is definitely decreasing. And a lot of times it, it may actually be coincident with the reflectivity maximum as well, which is also kind of what you would expect. But reflectivity is just a lot less reliable as an indicator of CBL depth than the, the differential reflectivity. So yes, I think there is potential there. I don't know that I would, um, I at least would be concerned. I mean, we're, we're getting these nice CDR channels on roughly half the days. Um, of course, in the summertime, you get them on more. I think for the nighttime signal, it will be less. You would see them on fewer days, but you can still see them. Uh, I also don't know if changes could be made to the ADAD um, that would make these signals more apparent. Um, mm -hmm. I, I had at least one talk with Dushan Zernick, which uh, suggested things could be done, but I am not a radar expert, so that's not a path that I can really take. Uh, but I'd love to have a discussion with somebody who would know how that would all work out. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Does anyone else have any final questions before we close out today's seminar? Okay, well, thank you everybody for attending today. And thank you so much to, to Professor Stensford for coming to talk to us. Um, so we will continue our seminar series next week. Uh, I believe it is on, let me just double check. I believe it is on Tuesday, not, yeah, it's on Tuesday, not Monday, because Monday is a federal holiday. Um, so thank you, everybody. Have a good week. Thank you.